Well, welcome everybody to our Power Over Scoliosis webinar on vertebral body tethering versus spinal fusion. Next slide. On behalf of uh, Patrick Cahill and myself, we would like to welcome you to what's going to be a fantastic webinar with our truly esteemed guest speakers. Next slide. Our surgeon speakers really are well-renowned experts in both spinal fusion and vertebral body tethering. And I know myself, when I hear them speak, certainly learn a lot. I'm looking forward to the webinar tonight. Next slide. But our real stars for tonight are gonna to be our two guest patient speakers, Sammy and Makina, who will relay their experiences, one with the spinal fusion, and our other patient uh, ambassador for uh, vertebral body tethering. So really looking forward to their uh, talks. Next slide. Really important, we want to make this as interactive as possible and to really make sure we get your questions answered. So please submit your questions through our Zoom Q&A section. We will do our best during the Q&A sessions to get to as many of those questions as possible. We may not be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best to either answer them live or to answer them in the chat. So please, we encourage you to submit those questions. Next slide. And we've really put this webinar together to cover all the key and cutting edge topics in uh, vertebral body tethering and fusion, including during a comparison between the two, summarizing the latest research. Of course, motion is really the crux of why we're trying to push uh, vertebral body tethering for the uh, correct patients. And then of course, find, uh, finding out who are the ideal patients for VBT. And then of course, as I stated earlier, we'll go to our uh, patient uh, stories and then have some concluding remarks. Next slide. I'd like to also put a word in for our foundation. It's the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation, a nonprofit 501c organization established in 2018. And our mission and our vision, which I'd like to read right now. So our mission is really to better discoveries and advanced techniques in the treatment of scoliosis in children and adolescents worldwide. And our vision is a future where children with scoliosis have the ability to live healthy, happy, and productive lives. And with that, I'd like to kick it off to our first uh, speaker, Dr. Feroz Mianji, who will be talking about the pros and cons of VBT versus fusion. Take it away, Feroz. Thanks, Summer. You can see my slides okay. Thanks. Uh, and as Dr. Simdani introduced, I'll, uh, I've been tasked about talking about the pros and cons of VBT versus fusion, and I'm Feroz Mianji out in Vancouver, British Columbia. So the principles of scoliosis surgery really are to prevent the progression of the curve, ideally through a single surgical event, and we really want to get a balanced correction of your spine. The uh, fusion, of course, is the gold standard. Um, with VBT on the market now, really it's the first time that another surgical procedure can be considered because uh, fusion is no longer the only option. And what that's changed really is patient autonomy and this concept of shared decision-making model is becoming increasingly the focus. Now, some of you may know this, but this is the Hippocratic Oath, which we all claim that we've taken. And on this, there's nothing about patient autonomy. What we've actually taken is called the uh, um, World Medical Association's Declaration of uh, Geneva. And if you look on here, patient autonomy is really high up there. Having said that, though, fusion surgery is really the, uh, has a track record, and so it is considered the gold standard. There's really no upper limit for curve magnitude. Anything over 50 degrees can be considered for a fusion, and your cosmetic result will be predictable and it'll be obtained pretty much immediately. Having said that, fusion is still considered fairly invasive. Your spine is instrumented. The joints that are connecting the vertebrae need to be mobilized, and you have to put down bone grafts so the spine fuses as a single column of bone. But again, the correction is immediate, and the chance of you requiring further surgery after fusion is considered fairly low, up to about 13% in most studies. So it is considered one and done with predictable results. Can you return it back to, uh, back to activity? Yes, you can. Generally at our center, it's a minimum of six months. Some centers may extend this up to a year, but the point is that you can return. This is a patient of mine who was a model for the original Google Pixel phone. And from time to time, she sends me emails of how she's doing. And 10 years after her fusion surgery, she decided to become a firefighter with the interior of uh, British Columbia. But we do know that fusion 
is at the expense of motion. And Michelle Marx has really uh, blazed the trail in this area, um, educating us about the implications of a fusion into adulthood, especially when you're fusing down into the lumbar spine. And we all agree that motion is important. And that really has been the impetus for the basic science models of non-fusion with the clinical proof of concept paper first published in 2010. Now, when you compare a fusion to VBT, in the thoracic spine, the VBT is done through a thoracoscopic approach. So it's considered less invasive. Your correction, of course, will be gradual because you're harnessing growth. And return to activity is a little sooner, anywhere from six weeks to up to three months in the conservative centers. Uh, it does preserve growth in particular through the areas that are tethered and instrumented as opposed to a fusion. And it also preserves motion much more uniform throughout the spine as compared to a fusion where you'll accommodate for more mo motion where you haven't had that fusion sort of lower lumbar down or the uninstrumented levels. Again, Michelle Marks and Peter Newton really uh, are credited. They just were up for a Hibs award at our most recent SRS looking at motion for VBT and fusion. And they've also um, demonstrated that VBT has less motion loss compared to a fusion. However, Cobb correction, of course, is a greater in a, in a fusion than it is in a VBT. Unfortunately, uh, as it stands, the chance of requiring further surgery after VBT is higher. It's significantly higher than a fusion. Early studies have suggested anywhere up to 47% for revision surgeries following a VBT. And the main concerns are really overcorrection where the uh, technology is just too powerful. Uh, and at times it's not powerful enough and the tether can fail and you may get deformity progression. And we can um, imply this by displaying of the two-lip screws following serial x-rays. So we have learned over time that patients that are either too young or the curves are too small, you may overcorrect. And if the patients are too old and the curve is too large, the tether may fail. So it really begs the question in that who is the ideal patient for this technology, raising questions of ideal timing, how big or small the curve should be, and how young or old does the patient have to be. And of course, large data is really essential to show any impact of these technologies in clinical trials so that we can offer it to more generalizable patients. And to that end, the uh, Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation, the HARM study group, really have set up a, a number of registries so that we can collect anonymous patient data from multiple sources so we can try and answer some of these difficult questions. I don't think any of us on the, on the webinar tonight are unfamiliar with the data-driven world we live in from Google to Facebook and all how it's capitalized on our data. Uh, and again, the HARM study group and the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation has done a very nice job setting up registries in the space of non-fusion technology since 2019. And what it has shown is some of the more recent data has shown that VBT complications may in fact be dropping. The most recent review in 328 patients from these registries showed a VBT revision rate of 22% as opposed to the 47% reported in some of the single centers. And fusion complications are also non-benign, 7% within 10 years. So in terms of decision-making, when you're looking at non-fusion, expect more discussion with your surgeon on timing of surgery, your curve size, your skeletal maturity, i.e., are you a candidate? And is there an appetite for more surgery potentially? With a fusion, the discussion is much more concrete with predictable cosmetic results and a potentially lower risk for reoperation. And so again, if you're looking for a cosmetic result, a single surgical event, fusion's the way to go motion preservation and early return to activity is important for you, then you can consider some discussion around non-fusion. It's very important to remember that all of our treatments are again, aimed at preventing curve progression. Surgery can off, uh, offer a curve correction, but that is again, not our primary goal. Fusion again, is no longer the sole surgical option in the space of idiopathic scoliosis. And I think our landscape has really evolved to a shared decision-making model. And for me, Fusion really is indicated in larger, stiffer curves in skeletally mature patients, where I do feel that VBT is not indicated. But for smaller, flexible curves with growth potential, I think it certainly can be an option. And over the past 10 years, my practice, again, majority is fusion, anywhere from 70 75%, with about 25 to 30% in the space of VBT. Thank you. Great, Froze. That was a really nice summary. Um, again, my name is Pat Cahill. I'm a surgeon in Philadelphia at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'll be serving as the moderator today. So as a reminder, this is your chance to kind of pick the brains of our, our panelists and uh, get kind of the inside scoop and ask questions that you were 
maybe didn't think of the uh, when you first met with your doctor or uh, um, wanted to get other opinions on. So please uh, feel free to put your questions in the uh, Q&A section um, and uh, and then we can um, you know put post those questions to our moderators or to our uh, panelists here. Faraz, I've had a question. So um, uh, what what have you been hearing from patients when they're they're coming to you? They know they need a surgery. Um, are are patients well educated about uh, the options, or what are some of the misconceptions that you need to dispel and and kind of redirecting that you need to do? Yeah, well, I don't think they're they're um, they're misinformed. I, I think they're coming in uh, better informed, and I, I think it's our uh, opportunity just to navigate. But I do think when it comes to the intricacy, sometimes you hear that fusion is a is a bad option. And any fusion patient is not going to do well. And I think we just have to reiterate uh, that, you know, in, in the, in the, I, I think if you have all the, all the tick boxes done, uh, fusion is still a, a good procedure. So I think sometimes we have to navigate patients that only want a VBT to say that, you know, maybe they're better indicated for a fusion. So I think they are well informed. And, and if you just make that shared decision making with them to see what's important to them to offer either one. Um, I know we're going to hear about some of the, the pros and cons, but um, how do you, what are some of the, some of the factors that you hear from families that are important in making that decision and how do you help them frame that decision? So, uh, cosmesis, I think if, uh, um, the question is really around the cosmetic result and where it, the spine is going to be at the end of it all. Um, I think that's really important to look at, you know, how high that is on their list. And if it is high, then I think fusion is really something we want to discuss a little further. Uh, again, motion preservation, if they're very active and they want sort of all that segmental motion to still be maintained, then I think tether. Um, and I think we have to really be open to say, you know, there is a potential for more surgery following a tether. And if that's the case, um, you, you just have to understand that and be ready for that. And then if it's a one and done deal, then I think fusion is where we'd probably steer them towards. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions that are now coming in through the uh, Q and a section. So um, one of the families wants to know, um, is there an appropriate curve magnitude and stage of growth for VBT uh, to be an option for patients? And then also the same uh, um, attendee has questions about the use of physiotherapy or rehab uh, protocols. Yeah, either in lieu of or after uh, the various surgeries in the recovery process? Sure. So quickly, ideal curve magnitude for me is sort of 40 to 60, 65 in a flexible curve. Sanders, uh, I'll do them up to from two to probably a 3B, sometimes a four, depending on, again, the curve size and flexibility. So there's a, there's a variety of things we have to take into consideration. Uh, and maybe the physio, yes, is very important, but I think in the interest of time, I can, I can um, maybe drop a chat to answer that question as we move along. Sure. And real quick, explain for us what Sanders uh, stages and scores are. Uh, okay. <laughs> very quick to do that. Uh, right. So the Sanders is a, a left-hand x-ray and we'll see some open growth plates and how they're maturing. And it lets us know how much growth or the spinal growth the patient has. It's a little more what we call granular than a risser grade, which I think the majority of the patients may have heard of. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, really great information. I'm excited to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Noelle Larson comes to us also from a very cold place, uh, and she's coming to us from the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, and she's going to kind of summarize the science that's been really uh, coming to the fore recently uh, in no small part due to the work of setting scoliosis straight um, and tell us kind of what um, what the data shows and, and what the data doesn't show. So uh, Dr. Larson. Thank you, everyone, and, and it's a fabulous evening. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in um, virtually. Um, I am on a couple of boards for POSNA as well as um, education committees, and then I have consulting research agreements through Mayo. And as we kind of heard, scoliosis is three-dimensional deformity, and I think what people notice the most sometimes is the rotation, right? The shoulder blade that's more prominent or the front of the chest wall that's more prominent, usually on the left. And just to level set, the type of curves we're talking about are fairly uncommon. So more like one in 3,000 or one in 5,000 patients have a, a curve that would benefit from surgery. Many, many patients do well with bracing or observation, or as we heard, physiotherapy or physical therapy. Um, and then it's always important to rule out 
other causes of the scoliosis. So young children, we think always need an MRI and older children need a careful neurologic exam because sometimes there's a treatable spinal cord problem driving the whole process. But today we're in kind of a unique situation that 10 years ago, really fusion was our mainstay of treatment. Um, and now in this idiopathic category, so for patients who don't have other conditions, we've got a couple of different options, including vertebral body tethering. Um, Fusion surgeries we heard from Dr. Mianji is very predictable. Usually we're thinking curves over 50, age is over 10. Uh, and people go back to a lot of activities and are, and are satisfied with their fusions. Um, since 2019 in the US, we've had vertebral body tethering um, with one device approved. And then more recently in May, now we have a second device approved. Um, and as we see in our world, you know, innovation is not optional. The world is con constantly changing and we need data to, to figure out what the best next step is and what the best surgery is um, for you or your child. And how to do that is really we try to look at the highest quality published evidence. So these are scientific studies. They're done with um, institutional approvals. And then we are peer reviewed. So people write a paper, it goes into the literature, other doctors from other centers look at it in a blinded fashion and give it criticism and make it better. Um, so there is kind of this process. And as we heard, you know, the fusion rods don't move. That area that's fused uh, doesn't move. And we're all very excited about the possibility of having preserved motion and, and allowing the spine to still move after a surgery. But with that comes some pitfalls, and we're trying to characterize that again in our, in our literature. So current indications approved by the US FDA are 30 to 65 degree curves. In reality, I think most curves that someone would offer surgery for is over 40 degrees. Um, and also failed bracing is one of the, one of the FDA criteria. And when it works, it works really nicely. I mean, we have some beautiful results out there, but the truth is we're not achieving these perfect results in every single patient and families kind of need to know about this. Here's a child that looked really nice at one year, but the cord broke and now at two years, the result is not as good. So we need to kind of have patience with the process. We're gonna refine and innovate and refine and innovate. And we're kind of on this pathway as we heard to progress. And we hope five years from now, this procedure will have lower reoperation rates than it currently does. But due to the high current reoperation rates, it's not for everyone. And again, we're just looking at research here. Research is different than an anecdote or a patient story. Um, and research is a little dry at times, but it gives us real information. So, so this is, I think, the most important study that's come out in the last five years, first from setting scoliosis straight from our group here. And it was a retrospective study. So we looked at patients who had already had VBT done at multiple centers and matched them to patients who'd had fusion surgery. Um, and the mean curve was about 50 degrees, which is typically what we see for a fusion surgery. Um, but patients in the tether group more frequently needed a second surgery and they got less correction. So breaking this down here, here's the plot. So before surgery, people had about a 50 degree curve. Right after surgery, the tether patients had fewer, less corrections. They're only corrected to 28 degrees and that didn't really change even at two years. The fusion patients got a little bit better correction and that also was stable over time. Um, then the reoperation rate is really the kicker, right? So 16% of patients overall following VBT needed a second surgery. And in the really closely matched group, it was 10% versus 2%. So somewhere from a five to eight times higher rate of a second surgery. So, um, and then why are you needing the second surgery? Well, sometimes there's two curves and we tether just one and the one curve kind of goes out of control and then we come back and tether the second one again. Um, this child had a second tether down the road. Sometimes we overcorrect. So the curve grows the wrong direction and we start to get a new structural curve. We start out with a right curve. Now we have a left curve. We have to go back in and loosen the cord. Many times it's a quick procedure, not always. Um, if you don't get enough correction from the get-go, this can leave a large residual curve and then require eventually over time, if the curve is not corrected, it tends to get worse and worse and worse. And if you wait a long time, you end up with quite a long fusion. So I think if things are not going well, it might be the time to, to jump in for a fusion. So in our center, we need we find we need a lot of correction to get that modulation and to get a good result over time. And then we're not so fearful of the reoperation. Um, so right now we're doing a prospective study. This is going to be an amazing study once we have prospective data on these topics, and this is forthcoming. Hopefully we'll start to see some of this prospective data coming out in the next year or two. Um, this is kind of the initial study. I'd say this is the other one. I only, I only picked three because the time is short. Um, but this was kind of the initial data that got the FDA approval for the tether. 
you notice these curves are quite small. They're only 40 degrees. And in this setting, all the main complications were just overcorrection. Um, and this is by Dr. Samdani, so we might hear more from this later. So I think we need to have patience with this procedure. We're learning, we're trying to make it better. We're doing high quality research. Um, we've seen that as we do more and more cases over time, we're able to get um, the surgery to have uh, better short-term outcomes. We're hoping we'll get better long-term outcomes. Part of the problem is are we actually studying the right things, you know, and we're gonna hear more in a moment from Dr. Newton about spinal flexibility. Um, there's more flexibility with the tether compared to a fusion. Um, we've shown that now in over 100 patients, um, but we don't know what the function of that is because people compensate with a stiff spine by letting the other discs move more. So right now we're really working on a shared decision aid. Uh, this is tools that allows patients to learn more about what to expect from the tether. Uh, we're working with the FDA. They're very interested in this with setting scoliosis straight. And we just published our first paper out of this, um, which looked at what do patients care about when they're looking at tether versus fusion. This is a survey of seven different centers. And we had all these different questions that we asked patients about, what do you care about? Do you care about fusion? Do you care about tether? We had people fill out a bunch of surveys. And basically people cared the most about appearance and motion. These were the things that families cared about. Um, and even if we had a really low reoperation rate, many patients still preferred fusion over non-fusion, which we were fascinated by. Um, and again, this is just showing that the VBT patients very, cared about motion, the fusion patients cared about appearance. And so there may be different surgeries that are right for different populations, and it's our job to educate patients on what surgery is right for them. Um, so now we're doing kind of a shared decision tool. We're teaching families and about um, how to interact and giving doctors tools to interact to say, share the best quality available evidence. Um, and here's just some little samples of our tool. Hopefully this will be going live in the next year or so that allow us to have a high quality discussion about tether versus fusion. I think this is great. This is a great activity tonight. And the more that we can have researchers and parents and patients and physicians work together, that's how we're going to make a lot of progress in our field. So thanks to Setting Scoliosis Straight for putting this together. And uh, I just look forward to a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Fantastic talk. Obviously, you've just done so much tremendous work in this space. Uh, just to get us back on time, I'm just going to ask two uh, two short questions here. Number one, you know, we have a lot of families that are on the webinar. They're going to view this later. You know, when they're looking at a literature that may be presented to them or on the internet, what are some red flags that you would say, you know what, this study may need more time, or this is a study that may not be as reliable as another study, whether if you can just emphasize follow up, patient numbers, control groups, I think that that would be important. Absolutely. And it's hard when it's outside of your field, right? Many of the parents in the audience may be professionals or professors or have areas of expertise. Uh, within our world, there's certain journals that we know are more rigorous and that are um, more difficult to publish in. Um, there's other journals where you submit a paper and if you pay the submission fee, that thing is going to be published with very minimal peer review. Um, so I think really finding a trusted colleague or advocate or physician that can get you through this whole process and can point you to the right resources. Uh, things like Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation, um, Scoliosis Research Society, they have um, articles that are discussed that are truly the top articles in the field that, as you said, have won prizes, have been rewarded or acknowledged to be the highest level of evidence. If it's just anecdotes, if it's just case series, it doesn't mean that that surgeon or that author is right or wrong. It just means that it hasn't gone through that same rigorous process of trying to arrive at the truth. Wonderful. No, thank you. And that's really one of our goals here at the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation is to really look at objective, good uh, data to help up, help us decide, you know, which options work best. Next slide, please. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Newton, a pioneer in our space, who's going to quantify motion in VBT versus fusion for us. Go ahead, Peter. Great. Thanks so much, gang. It's wonderful to uh, be on with all of you. Well, as I uh, bring this up, uh, you saw this slide earlier. It's uh, one that uh, uh, Michelle Marks presented to uh, the Scoliosis Research Society uh, and, uh, as mentioned, was uh, nominated for the Hibbs Award. Uh, I'm going to really present this paper in context of, uh, again, what families are interested in. Uh, and I think you know, framing this question about understanding motion is is so important. Uh, and I know that you really want to figure out how to quantify what does it mean 
to have uh, an area of fusion not move versus an area of tether that does when it comes to functional movements and how you live your life. Uh, I think there's sometimes a misconception that fusion removes all motion of your spine rather than all motion within the area of instrumentation. Uh, and the idea that tether preserves all motion is not a correct assumption either, as it turns out. But um, uh, this is obviously important space and uh, a lot, and work has been done. Uh, Dr. Larson uh, presented uh, one of the very first uh, papers radiographically looking at this and, and identified side bending and forward bending motion postoperatively after tether, demonstrating uh, motion remains within the instrumented segments, which was an important uh, proof that in fact uh, motion was preserved with, with tether, although we of course thought that that was the case. She was able to demonstrate the magnitude of that effect. And uh, Dr. Samdani's group, uh, Dr. Pays, uh, presented on motion analysis data, looking at patients who were in a gate lab setting, bending and measuring their trunk motion. And again, uh, found that you know there's less motion uh, when you have a fusion uh, than when you have a tether. Uh, trying to strictly quantify that uh, is a challenge, however, and it obviously depends on how much of a fusion you have and how long your fusion is uh, and how many levels need to be tethered. So the, uh, I'm gonna present to you the results of this paper. It gets uh, a little bit on the science -y side, but I've uh, tried to bring it down to a level we can all understand. And, and we really wanna look at the radiographically measured motion. So this is gonna be done comparing patients several years after surgery, two to three years, they either had a posterior spinal fusion or they had a tether procedure. And we're gonna quantify and actually measure in degrees the spinal motion that occurred in various bending uh, motions. So this was uh, data that was collected from five of our sites. It was really only for right thoracic scoliosis. So this is, does not necessarily apply to lumbar curves. And again, the follow-up time is uh, at least two years. Uh, the idea here is that if we take a radiograph with you bent all the way to the left and all the way to the right, we can measure each individual level and find out the change in angulation between those, between any level or between the entire spine. And uh, in doing so, uh, we can also look at, at forward bending. So we can look at the flexibility when you bend forward. We looked at three regions of the spine, the total spine motion, top of the spine, top of the thoracic spine to the bottom of the lumbar spine. We looked at the instrumented segment, where were the, the implants? And again, this could be for either posterior fusion or tether. And then we looked at the area below the instrumentation. This is the part of the spine that remains unaffected largely by the instrumentation, whether it's fusion uh, or tether. So it's a really important region that remains and the function of that part of the spine, uh, particularly if you have a fusion, is, is critical. And comparing how that changes with these two treatments was one of the goals. Uh, as noted before, we typically get more correction uh, with a, a posterior spinal fusion than we do with a VBT. Uh, but you know this is sort of known. And again, if your goal is, is straightness, uh, posterior spinal fusion has a, is a more reliable way of getting that. Motion, here's, here's one of the easy take homes. And again, this goes back to some of Noel's work, the instrumented region, the area where we put the screws, either a rod or a tether. If it's a VBT, your motion is decreased about 50%. So it's not, you don't keep all your motion. The tether has to reduce your motion somewhat to work. But if you have a posterior spinal fusion, your motion is decreased 100%. Uh, and I think that is uh, easy to understand. It's one of the basic principles. Uh, VBT reduces the motion within the instrument segment about 50%. If we look at overall motion, this may seem really surprising. Uh, we found, we did not find a statistical difference, although you can see that VBT motion overall was 70 degrees, posterior spinal fusion motion 63 degrees. That, at least with the numbers we had, wasn't statistically different. But you can see, even if it is, it's a relatively modest difference in the total side bending motion between patients who had a fusion and patients who had a tether. That implies that the segments must be moving a little bit more above and below the area of, of fusion because we just said the fusion segment doesn't move. Uh, so there is not a lot of difference in total side bending when it comes to the, the functional movement that we do, again, 
Side bending is just one movement that we do, but in this case, not much difference. However, in forward bending, there was about a 20 degree difference. So more flexibility in forward bending with VBT versus posterior spinal fusion. This is probably the most important plane of motion that, that uh, the tether allows, whereas uh, the fusion restricts. And it turns out that this, this bending movement, forward bending movement, probably much more common than the side bending movement. Uh, and so that 20 degrees, you know, may make a difference to people. Uh, and then again, you know, if you couldn't touch your toes before, you're not gonna touch them after. Does it matter to you? It depends what you're trying to do. But that's the magnitude of the difference. Interestingly here also in the uninstrumented spine below the area of fusion or tether, no difference in side bending lumbar motion. And it almost doesn't make sense given that we said you need to have increasing motion to sort of compensate. Uh, so, but no, no difference in side bending here below the instrumentation. But again, in forward bending, interesting here, the motion below the instrumented segment is more if you've had a posterior spinal fusion. And some, we, that makes us think that maybe that's a mechanism that the body is trying to use to compensate for the lost motion that occurred in the fusion above. And, and it might be that that's too much motion. The body has you know, designed an amount of movement through the disc that is normal. And so it may be that accentuated motion is actually putting more stress on those segments over time. And will that lead to premature arthritis? We do have a lot of long-term follow-up on thoracic fusions, which show that they do quite well. But there is an alteration in the segments below the fusion, causing the fusion causing them to move more than we think is normal. So uh, in summary, uh, the posterior spinal fusion gets greater correction of the curvature and the VBT instrumented coronal motion loss is about 50% that of a posterior spinal fusion. And there's modest but measurable differences in the motion within the instrumented region. Uh, we lose 100% of motion in posterior spinal fusion and about half that in a VBT. And overall total motion, modest differences, slightly less motion with VBT, uh, uh, sorry, so slightly less motion loss. Uh, so more motion with VBT uh, and the motion below the instrumented segment, uh, really subtle differences and primarily in the sagittal plane or in this forward bending. And we'll have to sort out whether or not that matters uh, over time in the long term with wear and tear on the disc, uh, et cetera. So uh, we really are uh, trying to, to get specific evidence regarding bending. Uh, and I think this is, uh, again, a helpful, we hope helpful information to patients to understand what does it mean when you say it's motion preser preserving and how much motion and in what planes of motion, because all that matters. And this isn't measuring all the other ranges of motion that we have, twisting and complex movements. Uh, and so it's hard to know how this translates to uh, other planes of motion. But uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, allowing us to share that uh, research study with you. Great. Thanks, Peter. This, that was really, really awesome. So um, I've been told we, we have time for one question to get us back on track. I, th I think there's a lot of really good questions, so I appreciate everybody for sending the, their questions in. I'll remind everybody that since uh, the way the laws are, we can't give specific medical advice or, or care uh, to any individual patient. So unfortunately, we can't answer those questions about your own case. But here's a good question, Peter. Uh, what is the pain like after surgery between VBT and a posterior spinal fusion? Oh, that's a great question. I, um, you know, for in my uh, experience, we've got great methods of pain control for both operations. Uh, the VBT is, quote, minimally invasive because we do these small incisions on the chest, but we're still working inside the chest and we've violated the muscle of the chest wall and it hurts a bit. But we've got good ways to give nerve blocks and, and, fascial plane blocks after either of these operations. And uh, and for me, the, the length of hospital stay and the time to recover to get ready to go home is about the same for either operation. It's, uh, it's about uh, three days in the hospital and you should be ready to go home. Uh, and so I, I, I think from a pain standpoint, I don't find them to be uh, markedly different. Great, thanks a lot, Dr. Newton. Um, all right, so I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Dan Hornschmeyer. Um, who's come to us from Missouri, and he's been one of the pioneers of vertebral tethering, and uh, hopefully he can answer some of the other questions that we didn't have a chance to get to yet. Well, thank you. Um, 
Let me share my screen. So I'm going to go over uh, the indications for VBT surgery, and this has been a very, uh, very, it's a, been a big journey for me from, uh, you know, when I first did my first VBT case about 10 years ago uh, to now, and here are my disclosures. And so there were a lot of questions that we uh, initially, you know, uh, sought out to answer the who, what, where, when, and how, and who was, what was the clinical problem, but who was our intended treatment group? And uh, Pat and the folks at CHOP uh, looked at, really, they applied the FDA indications uh, to their patient population from 2016 to 2019. And really, they found that this is really about 20, uh, 21% of their patient, surgical patient population, which kind of fits with what Feroz uh, shared with you guys earlier. And when you look at the indications and look at uh, Cobb angle, skeletal maturity, and curve flexibility, really the, <clears throat> the kids that are more skeletally immature with a smaller curve, we're going to consider more bracing. Uh, when they have a larger, stiffer curve and are more skeletally mature, we're going to consider a posterior spinal fusion. Uh, and then it really leaves this window of opportunity for VBT in the more skeletally immature patient with a larger curve and they have the flexibility. And so when you look at some of the early studies, things were kind of, there was a wide range of ages. So here you see ages from nine to 17 that were treated. Uh, and as far as the Sanders scores, those were from anywhere between two and seven as far as skeletal maturity. And then when we looked at RISER score for some of these earlier studies, it was anywhere from uh, zero to four. And so in our two to five year follow up, we showed that you could treat uh, a various range of uh, curve patterns with a 74 degree, 74 uh, percent success rate. And in there, we kind of talked about the best candidates for VBT being Sanders uh, stage three to five with Cobb angle between 45 and 70 degrees and some curve flexibility, uh, both with bending and with traction under 30 degrees. And then when we kind of looked at this slightly more mature cohort of patients, uh, an additional three years of follow-up, we did note that some of the deformities did increase over time. Revision rate, broken tether rate also increased. And the success rate did decrease slightly uh, with that additional time of follow-up. So when we looked at really when this surgery should be done and predicting growth models, we really have RISER staging, triradiate cartilage, and the Sanders staging. As uh, Feroz talked about, there's a lot more detail in the hand x-ray. And so Jim really described this in 2008, stages one to eight. But really, there's been authors like Kevin Neal that have really pointed out that RISER is a poor predictor of exact Sanders staging. And you can have a RISER stage one, but they could be a Sanders two or a Sanders seven. And so that's a wide range. We tried to use our hand x-ray data and really try to uh, better identify uh, these different Sanders stages because so many of the families come in and they're trying to identify just how long it's gonna take to go from a Sanders two to a three or a three to four. And we really identified the growth and the height gained uh, with each of those. So for a Sanders stage two to a five or two to a six, it was 2.5 years. And when it was a three A to a uh, six, it was 1.6 years. So these kind of layered out uh, with each of the Sanders stages. We tried to match up the Sanders stages with the growth velocity curve of adolescence. We then could better identify, and I like to show this to the patients uh, that see me in the office, because it helps them to identify and realize just where they're at on the growth maturity chart and whether they're really a good candidate uh, for VBT surgery. Here you see some of the more identifiable, or very important, I should say, black. it's kind of the black hole, Sanders 3A, 3B, and, and a late 3B. And these are kind of important stages to identify um, when we're looking at VBT candidates and how much correction we want to obtain. But these are also some of the hardest stages for us <clears throat> as surgeons to read uh, with the details. And Noel and uh, several folks kind of looked at 
the uh, intern uh, intro reliability and uh, and identify that there's big disagreements between Sanders stage two to four with the greatest issues being between uh, 3A and 3B. So what other factors kind of play into being a good VBT candidate? And I think growth modulation is very important as you see in this x-ray here. So we looked at 55 of our patients who had two-year follow-up and really tried to identify growth modulation as really some changes of six degrees or more of correction after their first direct film to any post-operative time point. And we identified them as either being successful or unsuccessful based on our uh, some of our original criteria. So in our modulated population, and here you see again an x-ray of somebody that modulated their growth, it was about 42% uh, of this uh, 55 uh, patient population. And we found 32 patients uh, who did not modulate their growth out of the 55 patients. And what we were able to identify is in the modulated group, Sanders staging of three or less or four or more was statistically significant. And whether you had open or closed triradiate cartilage was also of statistical significance. When we looked at RISR staging, it was kind of all over the board, and we could not find that to be of statistical significance. What was very impressive was in the modulated group, 91, there was a 91% success rate compared to only a 44% success rate uh, with the non-modulated group. And then one could think, well, maybe you're not treating the same curve sizes. But when we looked at our preoperative curve sizes for both proximal main and uh, thoracolumbar curves, uh, they were very similar. And then we thought, well, maybe I corrected one group more than the other. Uh, but when I looked at first direct films, uh, those were very, very similar as well. So really, VBT needs to be recognized as a growth modulation procedure. Alan A. Uh, did a nice job of applying the Sanders staging to his uh, cohort of patients and really showed the greatest amount of correction for a Sanders stage one, all the way to very little no correction uh, and growth modulation in a Sanders stage six or seven. And so here you see a, what I would recognize as an ideal VBT candidate who's on the front side of that window that we were talking about. So here you see a 52 degree curve, they followed up with me. There were no changes. So we kind of followed and discussed kind of where they were at on the uh, growth maturity curve, and we continued to brace them. Then in November, uh, they had pretty similar curve, but then you can see a few months later, they actually uh, jumped over to a Sanders stage two and hit some of that growth velocity, and their curve started to change. So within three months, we had really talked to him about B VBT surgery, and uh, we had a nice correction down to 28 degrees. Uh, you can see over the first year, this kind of modulated down to 11 degrees. And then at two years, there are Sanders 3B, which is a little bit concerning because they're nearly fully corrected. And so here's an example of a Sanders stage two where uh, again, 74 degree curve that modulated down to 10 degrees, uh, but this did, did require release of about two or three levels uh, at the bottom, uh, but they reached skeletal maturity. Here's another one, uh, what I would say is just right, a Sanders 3A, and this is a 41 degree curve that I corrected down to 13 degrees. It did show some evidence of growth modulation down to six degrees, and it had a little bit of a rebound uh, to 14 degrees. Hey, Jan. And then here's hey, one Dan. that's just- oh, Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, these are great uh, cases. I think what we should yeah. probably do is in the best interest of time, we should probably move on and we can okay. get some of these uh, answers. It looks like you're right at the end. Maybe you could uh, do your concluding slide. Yeah. So, uh, so again, growth modulations- important really to the success uh, postoperatively for our patients. And I think it's really a balancing act between skeletal maturity, deformity, flexibility, and intraoperative correction. And I really think that we need to look at the 
indications and be patient specific uh, based on a lot of our preoperative, um, you know, uh, statistics. So thank yeah. you. No, great work, uh, Dan. And you've actually really helped us push our thoracic tethers to the younger patients that are uh, less uh that are uh, less mature. And I think your slides really answer a lot of the questions in the chat about adult patients getting tethering. And I just think it deserves to be emphasized that I would say unanimously our panel thinks that for adult patients, tethering in its current form is not indicated. So I just wanted to really make sure we emphasize that. Next slide, please. Now uh, we want to make sure, Dan, that great talk. We want to make sure we have enough time for our two guest panelists, and you've heard some great uh, talks, but this is really going to be the highlight of our webinar. We're going to start out with Sammy relaying her uh, experiences with uh, with surgery. Go ahead, Sammy, take it away. All righty. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Sammy Schneider. I am 20 years old, and I'm currently living in Orlando, Florida. I am so grateful to be here with Setting Scoliosis Straight and to talk about my scoliosis and posterior spinal fusion journey. In April of 2016, my mom and I were having the time of our lives looking for bat mitzvah dresses for my big day that next month. We had to have run through at least four different stores before my mom noticed something was really off about my body. As I tried on my first strapless dress, she said, you look like you're missing a scapula. Your shoulders are all crooked, stand up straight. And I did. I tried to keep my shoulders square and my posture perfect, but something clearly was not right. I was experiencing no pain at all, just extremely uneven shoulders. It still persisted as the school year came to a close, so we decided to get it checked out. This was the first x-ray we saw of my spine, and it was alarming. Most people have a touch of scoliosis in their lifetime, but we had never heard of anything this severe upon look. first look. The summer went on and it was doctor visit after doctor visit. We finally found a solution that sounded really promising called Shroff therapy. I did this therapy for about three months, four days a week, hanging off, off of all sorts of apparatus for hours on end to try and make this nightmare go away. We then found out that my curve was not getting any better with this therapy and was now beyond the point of bracing. BBT was considered, but ultimately passed up due to the severity of the curve. At this point, it felt hopeless. My shoulders were getting even more uneven by the day. My chest was getting tighter and I was becoming even more miserable, as you can see in these photos. After getting around five opinions from doctors across the country, we came across Dr. Cahill and his team at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And on the morning of September 28th, 2016, I put my hair up and my brave face on as I went under for a seven hour spinal fusion from T4 to L3. I woke up with two titanium rods and 22 cobalt screws in my spine, three inches taller than I was that morning. I woke up singing Hamilton and Disney songs naturally, knowing the long journey I had ahead of me was going to be a challenge, one I was willing and ready to face head on. On September 29th, just the day after my surgery, I started walking. It was surreal to be three more inches off the ground than I was the morning before, but I mustered up enough mental strength to know that I needed to recover from this. I walked down the whole hallway and the next day I was walking up and down stairs with the help of my nurse practitioners. My scar healed beautifully, thanks to Dr. Cahill, and this is how it looked approximately four days post-op. The only complication that I have felt from the surgery was a tight chest every now and then, and obviously my flexibility is not 100%, but besides that, I have healed beautifully. The first couple of months of recovery were rough, both mentally and physically, but I was extremely lucky to have such a strong support system behind me, pushing me to do my best every second of recovery. Six months post-op, I started Pilates, where I am now a certified instructor, and played JV and varsity badminton every season after my surgery. Fast forward seven years, and I am now a stage manager at SeaWorld and a costume character performer at the Gaylord Palms. I'm also extremely active in campus life over at the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, where I am pursuing an entertainment management degree with a theme park and attractions management certificate. One of the greatest things I get to do, though, is sharing my experience with children and their patient and their parents who are going through the spinal fusion process, being a grounding support so during such a rough time in their lives. It truly makes me think back to how far I have come in my recovery and how much spinal fusion has changed my life. As I mentioned previously, none of this would have been possible without my amazing support system. Thank you to Dr. Cahill, Suzanne Manzoni, and all of the other doctors at CHOP for consistently pushing the boundaries of what's possible and delivering exceptional results to people like myself. 
Also, thank you to my family and friends who have tuned in to watch this presentation today and were my rock when I felt like normal life was not possible again. And finally, thank you to all of the research specialists at Setting Scoliosis Straight for having me on this panel today. Awesome. Thanks, Sammy. That, uh, that was really cool. Um, uh, and thanks for the shout out. Um, yeah, I definitely want to open it up to anybody who has questions for Sammy. This is like a really unique uh, opportunity for people to kind of, you know, uh, get the get the real story from somebody who's been through it and, and clearly from somebody who is uh, so articulate and can really um, speak to, you know, what what you felt and, and what you uh, felt emotionally and physically and all of those things. So, um, Maybe Sammy, there's been a few questions about pain. Um, let me, you talked about getting back to feeling like yourself. How long did that process take or what did that look like for you when you recovered from a fusion surgery? I would say the first two months were probably the most rough and the kind of pain that I experienced mostly was just muscle spasms. Um, but the pain really started to subside and it wasn't as consistent about two to three months post-op. Okay. And when were you back playing badminton? Uh, April. So about five or six months after. Awesome. Um, any other questions from any of the other panelists? Um, how about with, in terms of flexibility, Sammy, um, when you did go back to playing sports and doing exercising and doing things like Pilates, um, tell, you said you felt some limitation of flexibility. Tell us exactly kind of, can you try to quantify that or what that means in your everyday life? And then in what it means for those sports and activities that you do? Yeah, I wasn't super flexible, um, to begin with. I wasn't really a dancer, um, even though I'm a performer, but I was touching, I was able to touch my toes about six months post-op, um, just from stretching every day. And I think that Pilates and that kind of movement really helped, but um, I can touch my toes perfectly fine. And yeah, I don't, I didn't really notice a whole lot of flex, uh, flexibility changes. Um, bending side to side is a little bit rough in the sense that I can't really bend super far side to side, but when it comes to bending over and touching my toes, I didn't really see a difference. Demi, it's, uh, I'm really interested to hear that you became a Pilates instructor after having this, uh, surgery. It's really, uh, inspiring to know that you can do that kind of work in your core and uh, with with the flexibility and the strength required to do that, uh, it's great to hear. So maybe, how did you get into that? My mom and I uh, ended up getting our certifications together. I was actually the youngest uh, Pilates teacher at the time um, in the world. And so we kind of just fell into it together and we were practicing for hours on end and it kind of just felt natural. Sammy, hopefully you can uh, stay on and join us if there's uh, more questions um, at the end of our program. Um, and now uh, we're going to introduce our last speaker, uh, Makina, who is a patient who, like Sammy, also had scoliosis, uh, but unlike Sammy, she underwent vertebral body tethering. So Makina, thanks for sharing your story and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Makina. Uh, this is my scoliosis journey, scoliosis journey um, and I went through BBT. So I had initial concern around my back kind of in May of 2018. Uh, and then I was officially diagnosed in January of 2019 with a 45 degree thoracic curve and then 47 degree lumbar curve. Um, and then at the time I was 14 years old. Uh, the main effects of scoliosis on me uh, was with school, so I couldn't sit in class all day. I would often get severe back pain um, and come home with headaches, and then difficulty traveling for long periods of time. And then I also did brace for a little bit, um, and so I was insecure about wearing the brace at school. Um, Pre-surgery, so the time kind of from initial concern until official diagnosis, um, I tried Stroth exercises, Pilates, scoliosis physiotherapy, rock climbing, and then in January of 2019, um, I started bracing, and then at the initial appointment, I was told that I would most likely need surgery, um, and I had assumed that fusion was the only option, but after a lot of research, um, we found, my family and I found VBT. Uh, and then in February 2019, I had my initial VBT appointment, and then we decided to do, um, we decided to tether the thoracic and lumbar, and then in May of 2019, on May 1st and 3rd, I had two surgeries. Um, overall, my surgery experience was really good. Uh, it was seven hours and then five hours. Um, recovery in hospital was good and my pain was manageable. Uh, and then I slept for the majority of the first few days. Uh, and then I was released one week post my first surgery. Um, so 
post surgery, one week post op, I was able to stop taking prescription medication and use just use Advil as needed. Um, six week post op, I had full return back to school, and then three months post op, I got full clearance to do all activities. Uh, and then five months when school started back again, um, I was able to sit in class all day with no pain and no headaches. Um, it took a little bit longer to mentally recover since it was such um, a whirlwind leading up to surgeries, but I began to slowly start rock climbing again. Um, and then I got back into daily activities fully with no restriction. Uh, and then this is my most recent post-op. So this was a few weeks back. Um, I'm 19 years old now. Uh, and then this is four years, six months post-op. Um, life now, I am rock climbing consistently. I have full mobility. Um, I can sit and study for hours for university and stuff with no pain and headaches. Um, I can do all my activities with no limitations, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and yeah, I'm really grateful for my surgeries. And if I went through it again, I would do it over the same way um, as scoliosis and VBT is a part of my story, but it doesn't negatively impact my life or who I am. Um, and then this is just a little clip of me rock climbing kind of to show my mobility. This was just a few months back. Um, so about four years post-op. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful for my surgery since um, rock climbing is such a big part of who I am. So I'm able to still maintain that. Um, and then also pre-surgeries, this was really big as I think um, I strengthened my body a lot with rock climbing. And so it definitely helped post-op um, and just my experience and recovery um, was a lot quicker, I think, um, to recover because of this. Um, and then I just want to say, you're going to be okay. Um, I know for the people out there that are going through this right now, I know it's stressful and it's scary and it's uncertain. Um, and the surgeries in that time was a difficult time in my life, but I am so glad that I did them and so grateful for how they impact my life for the better now. Um, and then I'm also in my Bachelor of Human Kinetics um, and I hope to go into pediatric physiotherapy. Um, I just want to say thank you for listening um, and thank you to Dr. Mianji for giving me a straight spine um, and a new opportunity at life. And thank you for setting, thank you setting school as a straight for the opportunity to share my story. Wow, Makina, thank you so much for sharing that. You certainly had a phenomenal uh, surgeon. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of quick questions that are uh, in the chat. Um, you know, people are asking, how long did it take for you to feel that you had similar flexibility as to preoperative? And how long did it take to get back? And you kind of outlined it, but it'd be great to, great to hear it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think like the first few months, like I got clearance three months post-op, um, but it was definitely since it was such a, like, it was five months between official diagnosis and my surgeries that it was kind of a whirlwind. Um, so I think it took me like around six months to like get back into rock climbing and full mobility. Um, and then it was kind of like around seven or eight months that I realized I still had full mobility. Um, I was able to rock climb and do all that. Um, and that there was nothing that was going to go wrong. Like it was going to be okay. Um, so yeah, I would say probably took like three months I got clearance and then like two or three months after that, I was able to go back into rock climbing. Wonderful. And, you know, I'm sure as you were debating which direction to go in, whether it's VBT, whether it's waiting and maybe a fusion, I mean, what was really the number one factor that made you say I'd rather do VBT understanding as we know as Dr. Mianji had mentioned you know the risks of reoperation and some of the other pluses and minuses yeah um I think the main thing would be range of motion um that was something I did gymnastics as a kid um and then rock climbing was a big part of um kind of what I did and so definitely looking at the options between fusion and VBT um, I knew that there was risks with BBT with um, kind of revision surgeries and stuff like that. But I think at the end of the day, I was willing um, to kind of go with those risks and have the option and opportunity to have full mobility um, and just range of motion versus doing fusion, um, but not being able to go back and be able to twist and all those things. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, any questions from the panelists or anything else that I'm missing? Well, if not, want to just give a big shout out for sharing your story. That was that was fantastic. All right, gang, in the last minute or so, I'm going to just go through a uh, uh, couple of slides. This concludes our final webinar of the year. In 2024, we're going to continue to do these webinars. And as you'll see, there will be an opportunity for you to provide us really good, honest feedback so we can continue to uh, make these better. We are extremely grateful uh, for you for joining us. And as I stated, uh, we really would love for you to uh, provide feedback. And then of course, any contributions that are made to our foundation will continue to help support our ongoing research that will give us really good objective um, um, data 
uh, to help us decide, you know, the pluses and minuses of all new treatments that are coming out. Next slide. Of course, you know, a huge thank you uh, to our uh, research sponsors. We have Biederman Motec, Depew Synthi, Stryker, Nuvasive, Medtronic, AlphaTech, and ZimV. And of course, an even bigger thank you to our panelists and our patient speakers today. Next slide. You know, uh, we've just uh, recently released a fantastic uh, handbook. It's the fourth edition. And what we have new in our handbook includes uh, non-operative treatments and then fusionless treatments, including updating vertebral body tethering, how to manage uh, our bandages and scars, really a step-by-step -step, uh, guide and uh, to really inform patients on what to expect as they go through this journey with idiopathic scoliosis. Next slide. And for those of you that are interested, we have a whole channel that's dedicated to really disseminating good research and knowledge. We've got educational videos, helpful tips and videos, our research publications, and our main goal is to make sure we provide as good objective data as we can so you as a patient can really make the best decision uh, for your child. And I'd be amiss if I did not thank the organizers uh, of this event who truly made it a success, Michelle Marks, who's uh, on here, obviously Alan and Harvey and the rest of the SSF team. And as I stated earlier, please take the survey questions. That's what's gonna make us uh, better. So big, big thank you to everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you during our next webinar.